Soviet Union, April 86. The devastating nuclear accident of Chernobyl scares the entire world. Soviets, however, take their time to spread the news to the population. During the first 48 hours, the Ukrainians received punctual aid information only from Western radio stations. Radio Liberty was the most listened to before the BBC, Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Deutsche Welle, and of course, the Soviet television. Свобода 24 часа в эфире на всех волнах и во всех диапазонах. Germany's defeat in 1945 was sealed largely by the two non-European victors, the United States and the Soviet Union, the successors to Europe's unfulfilled quest for global supremacy. For the next 50 years, the defense of Western Europe as a bridgehead for USA would come to be known as the Cold War. An iron curtain was built to isolate both worlds. Each rival was clearly dominant within its own space, and each one used its ideology to reinforce its hold over its respective vassals and to blame the enemy. Moscow, the voice of the free people. People throughout the world listen when this voice speaks. But the warmongers from overseas do not agree. They want to frighten the people and force the American way of life on the rest of the world. What is this glorified so-called American way of life? Let us take a look at their cities, their recreation. This is wrestling, American style. signal for terrorizing honest people, these gangsters who are spread widely throughout the United States set fire to a cross. Since nuclear weapons might lead both parts to their mutual destruction, the outcome of the contest had to be eventually decided by non-military means. Considering all aspects, the only practical way to pierce the Iron Curtain and spread the news was radio transmission. The United States had three external radio stations. Voice of America, the official station of the government, Radio Free Europe, and Radio Liberty as supposedly independent stations. Radio Free Europe was directed towards Eastern European countries, while Radio Liberty was directed towards the Soviet Union having been set up in 1951 under the initiative of a peculiar private committee named AMCOMLIV, the American Committee for Liberation. This is Radio Liberty, an independent radio network sponsored and supported by the American Committee for Liberation, a group of private American citizens devoted to aiding the oppressed peoples of the Soviet Union bring about a democratic government in their homeland. The history is this, uh, both Radio Liberty and Radio Free Europe were initially funded by the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, there was a story put out, and the story is that Radio Free Europe was, was funded by wealthy businessmen and by uh, contributions from ordinary Americans, uh, and that Radio Liberty was funded by uh, big donations from, uh, from wealthy Americans. This was completely untrue, and the CIA uh, provided almost all the funding for both radio stations. Radio broadcast was a weapon, and when it addressed the enemy, it became a war weapon. In this particular war, on the air, 
the Soviets wasted no time in jamming the waves of liberty by building a fence with 3,000 stations of extremely effective interference. Well, Radio Liberty uh, began operations uh, in about 1956, and they used a small low-power transmitter that they borrowed from Radio Free Europe, and they started broadcasting from Lampertheim, Germany. And the story that I've heard is that it was just minutes, 20 minutes or perhaps half an hour, until the Russians were on that frequency with their own transmitters jamming the signal with uh, their own broadcasts. And it was a low power signal from Lampertheim, Germany, so uh, the jamming was probably fairly effective. I don't know whether the Russians knew the transmission was about to start or whether they were just monitoring the airwaves, but anyway, within a short time, I'm told the Russians were jamming the signal from Lampertheim. Now, to counter the jamming, so we knew the Russians would be jamming Radio Liberty like they had jammed Radio Free Europe. And so they looked for a station, the engineers and Radio Liberty looked for a station that would be the best location in the world for delivering a signal, a powerful signal, to Moscow primarily and the regions beyond Moscow and to hopefully overcome jamming. The ideal location for shortwave propagation is somewhere between 2,000 and 3,000 kilometers from the station, from the target you want to broadcast to. Pals is 2,700 kilometers from Moscow, Playa de Pals, Spain. So it's almost ideal. In the 50s, Pals Beach, situated in the Costa Brava, Spain, was practically virgin territory with very few visitors. Beside this beach, pre-selected by the Americans, there were only fishermen's cottages and a watchtower. Spain was a poor country under the fascist government of General Franco. The negotiations for an unusual renting of land in Pals by the Americans were concluded thanks to the diplomatic skill of Radio Liberty President Howland Sargent. In this nuclear age, people everywhere long for peace. Radio Liberty and others who communicate to the power center of communism help to secure the peace by identifying the true purposes of the free world with those of the Soviet peoples themselves. Howland Sargent, as early as 1951, before he joined Radio Liberty Liberation, was the chairman of the UNESCO uh, conference in Paris. And um, at that time, Spain wanted very much to become a member of UNESCO. Sargent uh, realized that there were objections in Washington to the entry of uh, Spain into UNESCO, but uh, he also became very friendly with a man who was the papal nuncio from the Vatican, at the conference in Moscow by the name of Angelo Cardinal, Cardinal Roncalli. People may not know who Angelo Roncalli was, but you know him as Pope John XXIII later on. They became very friendly, and the two of them, through their influence, managed to have the vote in favor of Spain entering. Sargent got a personal note from Franco thanking him for his role in the membership that uh, Spain uh, achieved. And he kept that letter until he went to Spain and he sought an audience with Franco so that he could try to convince the Spanish government to sell or lease the property on the Costa Brava. One thing led to another and ultimately uh, through the uh, Minister uh, of Tourism and uh, Information, a man I met in New York, uh, Fraga Ibirane, uh, the station, uh, the transmitter site was established. We were always very sensitive in our broadcasting from there uh, to make sure that uh, we were being uh, diplomatic about what we were saying about Spain. We would report on things in Spain, but of course we didn't want to antagonize the then government, uh, so that it was a delicate balance. 
The paradox was that in pursuing facilities for a radio called Liberty, the Americans consented to ignore Spain's lack of it. Pero yo recuerdo me impresionó muy bien aquello y todo lo que me dijeron que se hacía allí y me pareció en aquel momento la Guerra Fría un instrumento muy importante. Yo mis relaciones eran puramente de cortesía ocasionales de una visita que hice allí en algún momento que quiso verme en Madrid, pero eran relaciones absolutamente cordiales y superficiales. Ese fue un asunto que pasó muy discretamente, España lo vio discretamente y yo creo que la URSS también. Sabía que no podía evitarlo y, y punto. Albert Castejón was, from the beginning of the station's construction, one of the main engineers at the station and its head of maintenance. He had just finished his studies when he read about the job offer in a newspaper and duly presented himself. As the work initially entailed nothing more than building a radio station, he thought he would be there for a couple of years. But the salary offered was twice as much as he would ever be able to make in Barcelona. And so it was that he stayed there until he retired. Albert has come back today to visit the station that is now closed. He has met up with two former colleagues who also worked at the station. Chelo Arguelles, a woman originally from northern Spain, and Vladimir Borachov from Ukraine. All of them now live in villages surrounding Pals. In the meantime, the Spanish government is deliberating about what to do with the enormous station. Find it a new use as a radio station, reconvert it into a museum, or simply knock it down and recover the valuable land right on the seafront. There is a strong public debate and many conflicting interests. Foreseeing the worst, the former colleagues make one last visit, a private visit, and bring back memories of their lives at the station. One of the technical innovations that the Powell staff came up with, and this was not, this was not done by uh, the American staff in Washington or the American staff in Munich, this was generated and carried out primarily by the Powell's technical staff. They took the, uh, they came up with the idea to combine four 250,000 watt transmitters into a group D antenna so that that antenna could transmit one million watts and beam it towards Moscow. En la época que es va construir això, clar, hem de tindre en compte de que són molts anys, són quasi 50 anys, les dificultats tant a nivell tècnic com a nivell de d'elements i maquinària per poder fer aquestes torres, quasi quasi podríem dir que és una cosa de tipus de... Digo, com les piràmides d'Egipte, no? Però es van fer, es van fer i es van fer amb els mitjans que en aquella època es feien, es tenien a l'abast, no? Això es va fer portant els materials amb uns camions que en aquella època també eren molt petits comparativament amb el que hi ha ara, aquests trams tenen més de 7 metres, cada tram, per tant necessitàvem un camió que portés trams de 7 metres. Vam vindre tots des de Barcelona fins aquí, amb dificultats per poder passar, per poder passar segons quins llocs i quins llocs, aquests elements tan llargs i tan grossos. Però bé, jo crec que dintre de tot es va fer es va fer de la manera més fàcil que es podia fer en aquella època, que era manualment. No tenint els equipaments tècnics, manualment es va fer. Era cosa d'homes i d'ingeny.
The magnitude of the construction in such an unexpected place, the secrecy that surrounded the passage of great heavy trucks, all contributed to creating among the inhabitants of the area an atmosphere of uneasiness, and consequently all kinds of rumors started to circulate. Una vez que publicó la revista Destino, Misterio en la Costa Brava. Si príncipes y varones, bueno, que, 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 que trabajan. Era, era un reportaje, bueno, relatando que algo misterioso ocurre en, en, aquí en la provincia de Gerona, en Gerona de Paz. Pensaban que eso era de los de guerra y que eran cosas extrañas. O sea, no, 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 ignoraba completamente, no sabía, no sabía lo que era. Me, me, me discutía con la gente, me decían, oh, que hay misiles, en fin. La gente no, era difícil que se entienda. Que si yo, que si fuera una base de no sé qué, que si sería una, de, que sería una otra de no sé cuántos, pero lo que va a cridarme la atención va a ser esta que diguessin que feien una un lloc de submarins, que els submarins entraven per sota i, i entrarien, per so, entrarien per sota, no, que entraven. Bueno, sí, això, ja. I que, bueno, i que aquí hi havia una base de submarins. Algunos decían que aquí había claves secretas para lanzarlas a los contrarrevolucionarios rusos, a los, de, bueno, a los que eran contra el régimen soviético. Después, por favor, se corrió de que las antenas eran rampas de lanzamientos de misiles. Bueno, se decía de todo, ¿no? The station became a compound that had all the facilities necessary to be able to operate independently of the outside world. It had its own fuel service for the cars and for the diesel generator. But since the supplies were all bought in the surrounding villages, nobody lost out. Aleshores, hi havia també el contacte amb la gent que hi treballava que no explicaven res del que hi treballaven, entre altres coses, perquè no ho podien explicar. Està clar que feien una activitat eh, que, encara que fos legal, eh, havia de ser discreta. Ningú explicava que feien... què explicaven exactament les radioemissions, no se sabia mai. No? La persona que treballava els americans eh, era vista amb una certa enveja perquè tenien un sou garantit, perquè tenien una feina garantida i perquè es pagava bé i perquè evidentment això tenia uns resultats i unes evidències en la vida civil. No? És una persona que es podia comprar determinades coses, que podia disfrutar de determinats plaers de la vida, cosa que la gent que treballava a la fàbrica o que treballava al camp li resultava una mica complicat. No? It's early morning along the rugged Costa Brava, the Mediterranean shore of Spain. Past a 2,000-year-old Phoenician lookout tower built to guard against pirates, a Spanish antenna tower technician hurries to get to work on time. At Radio Liberty's Costa Brava site, the transmitter in this one room is half a million watts. The most powerful United States domestic radio stations are 50,000 watts and the huge power plants to keep all this equipment operating form another part of the solution. The PAL station had six transmitters, four group curtain antennas along the one-mile beach, and the sea ahead as a mirror. The powerful signal of one million watts, with an optimum angle degree of 4.3, bounced off the ionosphere and reached Moscow. It would then keep bouncing over Siberia and eventually around the planet until it was ultimately received in the little shack expressly built some kilometers inland from the station. Ionosphere propagation characteristics change during the day. Some frequencies propagate in the morning, some during the day, and some at night, west to east. These frequencies at certain times of the day cannot be jammed east to west because the propagation is not there. When it is morning in Spain, it is evening in Siberia, where the jamming transmitters were located. So Spain had a window of about two to three hours when they would propagate to Moscow, 
while the jammers in Siberia and the Far East could not propagate to Moscow on those frequencies. This was called twilight immunity. Although the mission assigned to the station was basically technical and logistical, PALS also needed interpreters and translators to ensure the correct transmission of its programs. The selection of this staff by the Americans would be a delicate task, since the candidates, who would be resident in fascist Spain, but would logically have some link with Eastern Europe or the Soviet Union, could well have secret pro-Soviet sympathies or undertake undercover spying operations on behalf of the USSR. The interviews were therefore held discreetly at the Castellana Hilton Hotel in Madrid. Un día yo estaba en casa tranquilamente y leo un anuncio en el periódico que dice se necesitan traductores Costa Brava presentarse en Castellana Hilton. Pues claro, me presenté y allí nos hicieron una prueba de traducción del, del ruso al español y del español al ruso también. Llegué a Castellana Hilton, pero procedía desde Ucrania, atravesando eh, Checoslovaquia, Alemania, al ver que se acercaban eh, otra vez la ocupación de Ucrania, bien por los ejércitos eh, rojos, alemanes huían y era evidente que no era posible como yo he visto y tomé la decisión por dentro que no podía yo vivir otra vez el drama lo que el sistema comunista en su representaba. Yo nací en Gijón, viví allí y cuando empezó la guerra civil pues a los niños más pequeños, pues nos evacuaron a Rusia. Y allí estuve en una casa de niños y después estudié y trabajé allí en Rusia. Y por eso sabía el ruso. No dije ni a mi madre, ni a mi padre, ni a mi íntimo amigo que yo tomé decisión de salir de Ucrania. Cogí mi violín que era al lado de, de, de lo que, de lo que, que era afición, no afición, y atravesé con esto bien, bien hasta Alemania e intentaba allí continuar estudios y cosas, hasta llegando a España, donde recibí una beca que era una suerte. Había un jefe americano muy simpático que se llamaba Scott, y mmm, cuando... Se trataba del texto, que nos dio un texto, ponía, habla Radio Liberty, aquí Radio Liberty, en ruso, Gavarit, Radio Stances, y yo le pregunté, digo, oiga, ¿esto qué es? Una, dice una emisora, digo, es de propaganda, porque si es antisoviético, yo no quiero ir, <risa> porque claro, toda mi educación y tal, yo lo veía solo blanco-negro, antisoviético no. O... Y efectivamente, al llegar a la emisora, eh, aquí de Radio Liberty en Pals, Bien, pues eh, me sentí como si fuera a Ucrania, porque al lado de, de toda identidad ucraniana estaba en las cintas cada día que salía. En el ucraniano programa Radio Svoboda. Radio Liberty wrote and recorded most of its programs in New York and Munich, two locations very far from the PAL station, with its uninterrupted programming 24 hours a day. Initially, the processes of delivery were very rudimentary, but they improved as time went on. Al principio de todo, venían para avió cada día las cintas, las tenían que ir a recoger a Barcelona y portarlas aquí. Después ya va a ser para línea telefónica, unas líneas especiales que es deien musical y d'ordres y arrabían los programas. Més endavant eh, es va a montar un centro de recepción a San Clemente de Peralta para rebre o vía radio, para si un caso fallaban los otros sistemas. Después se va a pasar una trabajada a la línea telefónica para que ya tenía más buena calidad y más tarde pues, ya había satélites arrabían los programas, que es como si diguéssim al final ya de aquí arribaban en esta sala en aquí es clasificaban per las diferentes horas las diferentes frecuencias y los diferentes transmisores y se enviaba el audio a cada uno corresponent a cada uno a la hora correspondiente 
I així és les 24 hores del dia, clar. En dies de siete idiomes. Bueno, pues mira, puedo decirte, es decir, principalmente el ruso, que iba 24 horas. Después ucraniano, que ocupaba segundo lugar, que había seis horas, a veces ocho, esto depende de esto. Después bielorruso, bien, bielorruso. Después vivía para todos los países del Cáucaso, que tenían allí. Tienes Azerbaiyán, tienes Turkmenistán, tienes Kirguiz, tienes eh, Kazaj. Después ni es georgiano, después ni es armenio, bueno, todos los países del Cáucaso y después de los países bálticos. The block programming was meticulously prepared in New York and Munich. Strict supervision of the content was essential in order to avoid staff personal contributions exceeding the framework of the policy of the radio. Uh, for example, there was a, um, uh, a time at Radio Liberty uh, back in the 70s and early 80s, uh, when some of the Russians uh, who were anti-Semitic, because unfortunately anti-Semitism existed for a long time in Tsarist Russia and in Bolshevik Russia, and even to a certain extent today in what's supposed to be free Russia. Uh, and so some of these people would insinuate their anti-Semitic statements or using certain texts for their own purposes. So un unless these programs were carefully monitored before broadcasting, they wouldn't be caught. So in time, we established a pre-broadcast monitoring to, uh, to vet, to uh, clear these things. Primero, cada hora se dividía en unos bloques, ¿no? Empezaba la sintonía de Radio Liberty, que era un himno antiguo ruso. Estaba tomada de un himno antiguo ruso. Después había 10 o 12 minutos de noticias, que es así que cambiaban cada hora. Después había lo que se, eso se llamaba N, después venía Y, que era corres, mmm, revista de prensa, unos cuantos minutos, y corresponsalías de cualquier país del mundo, de cualquier capital, dependiendo de dónde estaba la actualidad, claro. O bien que fuese un tema cultural o folclórico, lo que cualquier, o deportivo, un acontecimiento deportivo en cualquier sede. Y la segunda, un tema que podía ser pues, muy distinto, económico, cultural, literario, eh, pues, deportivo, mmm, de cualquier tema mmm, soviético o del extranjero. Había un espacio dedicado a cartas de los radioyentes, que esto era muy interesante y eso lo teníamos cada día y bastante, con mucha atención. We realized that if anybody wanted to write to Radio Liberation or Radio Liberty in Munich, Germany, the censors would tear the letters up and they might arrest the person who sent the letter if they found out who was doing it. But by broadcasting what we call accommodation addresses, they were addresses of people who lived in various cities of Western Europe, and if people wrote to them, it might be possible that the censors who had a lot of work to do, especially as things were getting more and more relaxed after Stalin died, uh, would let some letters go through thinking that they were innocent. Дорогие друзья радиослушатели, запишите адрес, по которому вы можете нам писать. Анна Петрова, 150, Хенникер Гарденс, Лондон, Е. Точка, Шесть. Andrea. Había preguntas de toda clase, y no solo preguntas, sino peticiones. Por ejemplo, pedían que leyéramos sobre todo eh, fragmentos, o si podía ser entero, pues publicaciones que allí no se editaban of oficialmente y que se difundían a través del Samizdat, o sea, con multicopias y todo esto. Y libros que allí estaban prohibidos, por ejemplo, que te diga, de soviéticos muchos, Pastor Max, Orzhenitsyn, Y de extranje, del extranjero, por ejemplo, este que hablábamos el otro día, de Santiago Carrillo, Eurocomunismo y Estado. Era una crítica en la que yo hablaba de la existencia de un sistema que formalmente, en algunos aspectos, se parecía al fascismo. Eh, no era una dictadura del proletariado, sino una dictadura sobre el proletariado. Eh, hombre, si hubiera sabido que lo iba a dar 
lo iba a transmitir Radio Liberty, a lo mejor no lo hubiera escrito. No lo hubiera escrito, pero ese libro yo lo escribí sobre todo para los españoles, tuvo una gran trascendencia. Comprendo que Liberty utilizara ese libro eh, contra los, el sistema soviético, lo comprendo, pero ese libro eh, estaba hecho no para destruir a la Unión Soviética y para destruir el sistema soviético, sino para la democratización de ese sistema. Programming was also dedicated to music. Radio Liberty could not transmit this programming at first because jamming was very disturbing for musical audition. PAL's station, with its own power, managed to solve this problem. Perhaps this was why the station appeared on the record cover of a jam session recording made by members of Benny Goodman's band, made for the program The Jazz Hour. Music played an important part in the mission of Radio Liberty. Radio Liberty and Radio Free Europe became pioneers in promoting to the rest of the world the markedly hedonistic cultural values of American music, cinema, eating habits, and even fashion. A l'escola, jo el que recordo era que venien, venien fills o germans o nebots de gent que treballava en la ràdio, la ràdio Liberty, i que... Eh, Bé, el seu testimoni era especialment divertit perquè ells portaven, de tant en tant apareixien doncs, amb, un, amb un bolígraf ultramodern o amb una navalla multifuncions de que aquí llavors encara no se'n veien gaires, o amb còmics americans, naturalment amb anglès, eh, o pilotes de beisbol, o coses d'aquest tipus que aquí estem parlant dels anys 60 i principis dels 70 en aquí encara no, no es veien, no es, no es coneixien o no es podien adquirir o eren molt cares d'adquirir. From country to rock to jazz, all the main American performers were paraded on Radio Liberty, including musicians such as Louis Armstrong. One of our Russian producers wanted him to announce himself in Russian, so he taught him to say, this is Louis Armstrong speaking over radio, it was then Radio Liberation. And uh, he, he had that certain kind of a, of a gravelly voice. And so he said that in, uh, in Russian. And then they played a Soviet song from a very popular film that was being shown in those days in Moscow and throughout the Soviet Union. Uh, and he listened to the song and picked up his trumpet and he played what they call a riff, I guess, in the language of jazz, uh, as a background to the film. And, of course, we use that on the air and use it over the years. Yo creo que la labor más importante fue la informativa. Y el hacer despertar un poquito a la gente no para destruir el sistema que tenían, que esto yo no creo que fuese la misión, sino para informarles de cómo era su propia vida, cómo vivían sus intelectuales perseguidos. No sabían ni siquiera que por cualquier disidencia pues, se iban a la cárcel. Tenían el Pravda y el Izvestia. Y el Pravda quiere decir verdad, Izvestia quiere decir noticias. Y la anécdota que corría era en el Pravda, o sea, en la verdad no hay noticias y en las noticias no hay verdad. So our whole policy, which was encouraged by the American government, was be an objective radio station, objective in the sense of telling the truth, but working toward the goal of bringing the people a concept of what life could really be like if there were freedom of religion, if there was uh, freedom of speech. Mire usted, los pueblos soviéticos, los rusos particularmente, eran gente muy patriota, e incluso aunque no simpatizaran algunos con el sistema, tampoco les gustaba que desde el exterior, y menos eh, la superpotencia rival, eh, viniera a decirles lo que tenían que hacer. Si había algo, alguna especie de propaganda, era tan sutil, tan sutil, que era, por ejemplo, cómo vive un granjero americano, cómo pasa el día, o cómo su nivel cultural, o cómo es las universidades. Este sentido, para que ellos también se enteraran, 
como se vivía en Occidente. ¿no? Más bien era un poco sutil la propaganda. American Dream Lifestyle Propaganda might be sophisticated, perhaps even imperceptible. But in the 70s, a group of senators led by J.W. Fulbright looked forward to achieve the total shutdown of Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty, literally asking to throw the stations on the trash heap of history as a relic of the Cold War. So several years later, Congress made a decision that there would be no more CIA funding, that Congress would establish Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty as semi-governmental agencies, and they would be funded by uh, grants from Congress. And so at that time, the status of the radio stations changed, and also the, the old leadership was basically got rid of. Since the 70s, we have had a government-appointed body called the Broadcasting Board of Governors now, and their job is to make sure that there is no government influence on our news and, and broadcasting. Uh, so while the U.S. Congress may say broadcast to Afghanistan, it's our responsibility, working with our board and the U.S. government, uh, who gives us the money, to determine how we do that. But in terms of content of the program, there's very, there's no influence at all from the U.S. government. In 1975, Radio Liberty faced a new challenge. Franco died, and the station started to suffer open public criticism from Spanish society. Para mí era incomprensible cómo en España que iba a la democracia porque Franco había muerto, claro, y primero lo que eh, los partidos políticos surgieron y se lanzaron todos contra 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 Radio Libertad para 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 cerrarlo y vení, venían aquí eh, los corresponsales entrando en el campus tenían eh, la ansia de cerrarlo. Le digo, pero hombre, pero Os duelen estos eh, torres soberbios, pero de, lo importante es lo que sale de estas torres. Es el contenido. Y digo, ¿cómo no podéis oír los programas de lo que sale? No podéis saber lo que será de Liberty. Entonces ponéis pon antenas contra los pueblos de la URSS. Yo digo, ¿os habéis equivocado? Porque debías haber titulado antenas... Antenas de paz, de, de, de Radio Liberty, son antenas para los pueblos de la URSS. From 1975, roughly, to 1990, we operated from PALS without an official agreement. We were operating based upon the old expired agreement. And the, the Spanish authorities were happy with that. The American authorities, authorities may not be happy with it, but we were satisfied with that arrangement as long as we could continue to broadcast. I think that Felipe Gonzalez, one of the uh, contributions that he decided to make to the cause of freedom in uh, the communist world was to accept the existence of the, uh, of, of the transmitters, uh, and eventually it became not really a matter of political debate in Spain because all of the major parties uh, quietly supported the uh, continued existence of, of those facilities. Radio Liberty continued to broadcast for 14 more years until in 1989, with the disintegration of the Soviet Empire, Washington started to consider if the station's mission might have been fulfilled and to question whether the continued existence of the PAL station could be justified from an operational or financial point of view. The American government offered the installations to other allied stations, but without success. Finally, it was shared with Radio Free Europe and the Voice of America. The younger staff in the U.S. government ended up winning the day. On May 25th, 2001, Washington took the final decision.
since the end of the Soviet Union, we have focused our attention, like NATO, to the Central Asia, Iraq, Iran, the Middle East, and the Caucasus, and countries like that, where there are still very uh, uh, repressive dictatorships. People in Washington, my colleagues at the board, and my colleagues in the IBB who were for closing the station at Powell's, accused me of being uh, living in the past. And I understand how they think that way, but the way I see it is that I'm not living in the past, I'm living in the present. And they are living in the future, a future that does not yet exist, a future of the internet and a future of local AM and FM, a future of satellite television and radio, which absolutely should be pursued. I have no question with the uh, advantage of pursuing those new technologies, but not at the sacrifice of the existing present technologies that people in the Soviet Union still rely upon. Ownership of POWs has now returned to the Spanish government. What should it do with these giant facilities by the sea? Perhaps throwing them to the trash heap of history as a relic of the Franco era? For five years, defenders and detractors of the continued existence of the station have been locked in argument about its future. Despite the progressive and dangerous deterioration of the facilities, the government has maintained its silence. The final outcome is difficult to predict. Mirte, yo prefiero conservar los libros de Steinbeck o de Hemingway o de John Dos Passos uh, o de cualquiera de los grandes escritores americanos que están allí en mi biblioteca a conservar esas, esas ruinas de un arma, al final era un arma, de un arma que no existía para eh, extender la cultura sino para atacar otros pueblos. Lo que sí me da pena que pues no sé lo que hicieron con todo lo que había porque aquí teníamos una biblioteca preciosa con muchísimos volúmenes rusos y había diccionarios y diccionarios y había muchas cosas que por lo menos podían preguntar a la gente si alguien la quería porque eso fue todo a la chata tanto el material técnico como que no se creó y esto porque supervisaba mirando mm, esto me dio es pena decir, es decir eh. esta parte para mí es casi bueno un pecado un pecado sí señora sí, sí es que sí, lo sabe sí. ha sigut per mi un error. Això es podria haver conservat tant com per fer museu de ràdio, com per fer museu de pesca, com fer museu de flora. Aquí hi ha animals, hi ha, hi ha de tot aquí perquè ha estat un centre tancat que no s'ha trepitjat i que per part del personal ha sigut sempre, s'ha tingut cura de que no es desfés res.
Filmaren Frederick Wiseman har ett alldeles unikt filmspråk och ligger bakom filmer som till exempel Lag och ordning som vi visade nyligen här på Access TV. Nu är det dags för hans film om livet bakom American Ballet Theater, om mördande repetitioner och om skön konst. <skratt> 